Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Mark Newman, the president and founder of Precision Analytical. Uh, we're the creators of the Dutch test, so we specialize in reproductive and adrenal hormones. And today we're going to take uh, a journey through kind of just questions about testing and how to uh, sort of uh, just have good fundamentals in terms of how we approach the questions of hormone testing. Uh, in terms of your presenter, myself, I've been in this industry my entire career. Um, I've had the pleasure of governing over, gosh, probably a couple million hormone tests in urine and the same in saliva to a lesser degree, but still significantly uh, with blood testing um, and trying to parse out the, the pros and cons of the utility of those tests. Uh, has been kind of a 20 year journey for me in trying to figure out, uh, you know, where are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Where should we be using one test versus another? What are the limitations as it relates to that? I have a particular interest, uh, which we'll only touch on briefly today, but uh, particularly the uh, ever confusing subject matter of once I'm on hormones, now which test is best? And that can get pretty confusing and we're not going to go into that in much detail today but we will touch on that um, at the end so we'll just get started here my slides are deciding they don't like to move forward so give me just a second and we'll get going hey there we go um, so you can you can put us under whatever umbrella you like best uh, functional medicine integrative medicine whatever um, why are we doing this as opposed to what traditional allopathic medicine is doing? Generally, it's because you see this type of patient, right? Your perimenopausal woman, um, she's tired, she's depressed, she's got insomnia, all of these sorts of things. And traditional medicine is saying, uh, generally, what tools do we have to eliminate these symptoms? That's a model of medicine that I think serves us well in some situations, but when it comes to, to these types of situations in men and women um, who have these very common issues, you know, we think there's probably a better approach at saying, look, what are the root causes of depression? You know, probably not a Prozac deficiency, although maybe serotonin is related, maybe cortisol is related. We wanna unpack that and try to get at the root cause of what's going on. And in doing that, we kind of have two options. One of them is to just look at these and guess what's at play, or we can use testing. And I don't mean that as a cynical question. You can actually do some really good investigative work by just doing a thorough uh, questionnaire and having a thorough conversation with your patients and trying to figure out you know, what systems may be under some sort of dysfunction. And then what do you do to address those? The challenge is, if you look at something like fatigue, you know, maybe your initial guess is, aha, it's a, you know, cortisol dysregulation, you don't have enough cortisol. But, you know, if they're a 50-year-old man and they're presenting with low testosterone levels, that also is going to probably uh, result in some fatigue. Maybe it's a thyroid issue, right? There's a lot of overlap here, and that's where thorough testing of these hormone systems can be really helpful as we search out the answers to whatever's going on with a particular patient. Now, categories of hormones, we'd find most things in adrenal, reproductive. Those are the two we're going to focus on today, but we can never forget about those foundational elements that aren't part of our talk today. Thyroid, uh, you know, insulin and, and related markers. Um, and so within that testing of hormones, we've got to figure out which tools to use. So the first rule that I use, now the lab that I own doesn't do any blood testing. We do the Dutch test, so that's the dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. We do a little bit of saliva testing to grab the cortisol picture. So everything we do is, is saliva and urine-based and, and mostly urine-based. Uh, so we're sticking in the reproductive and adrenal hormone uh, sort of lane, um, but we need to look at thyroid and, and things like that in your patients as well. And rule number one for me is stick to blood unless there's a compelling reason to go otherwise. So just as an example, Things like thyroid and insulin have been historically tested mostly in blood, but you can also find tests in saliva for those things, in blood spot for those things, in urine for those things. Those, I think, are intellectually very interesting, um, 
but I don't think there's a reason to get outside of blood testing uh, unless there's some odd reason to be compelled to for those. Those tests are just commodities in blood, along with all these other things I listed here. There's no reason to go through these in detail. This is just a list of somebody's general panel outside of reproductive and adrenal hormones that they run in blood testing, right? And there's just no reason to get outside of blood testing for most of these things. It's a commodity. It works fine. Um, and we, we definitely want to be looking at these things in our patients. So my mantra for testing is that serum is the default. And then cortisol it is really what drives us to using saliva testing generally. And the comprehensiveness of testing is what drives us to look at urine testing. So we're going to unpack that a little bit in this lecture. So as we're looking at adrenal and reproductive hormones, the Dutch test has all of these different pieces, right? Not just estrogens, but also the metabolites, androgens and the metabolites, the free cortisol pattern throughout the day and the metabolites and melatonin and some other related things. So it's a really comprehensive way to look at those. But when we look at the hormones that we're generally interested in, if we're not looking to get super comprehensive, blood testing is gonna work just fine. For these and, and in fact i would consider it the gold standard for these hormones is to do a serum or plasma uh test for estradiol testosterone those types of hormones and at the end we'll touch just briefly on this but there are some exceptions to this meaning blood testing works great for progesterone but there are some supplementation situations where blood testing is not going to give you the right answer so just generally We've got hormones in circulation. They're mostly protein bound. So when estrogen is made by the ovary, it's gonna be made in its free form. It's going to attach to a binding protein. So that would be sex hormone binding globulin and albumin primarily. And that's how it's circulating, right? Most of that hormone is protein bound. Only when it's free is it able to get into the tissue and do something. But this is how it generally circulates. And that's what we find in serum is the hormone like testosterone or estradiol bound to a binding protein, right? That's what we find there. In saliva, that binding protein hormone complex doesn't get in. That free hormone that's circulating finds its way into saliva. So it's, it's actually a different measurement than what we're looking at in serum. It's the free hormone. Right, and this this representation is close, but not exactly right. Um, this looks like it's about 10% free hormone. It's more like two or three uh, percent free hormone. So most of it's protein bound. The small amount that's bioavailable and free is going to get into saliva. Now, what about urine? In urine testing, that free hormone that's circulating when we're talking about reproductive hormones can't get into urine. It's not water soluble enough, right? So it's going to go to the liver. The liver is going to put on it a water soluble constituent group, right? So a glucuronide or a sulfate. So instead of testosterone, it's gonna now circulate briefly as testosterone, glucuronide or sulfate, and then that finds its way into the urine. So three different tests, three different forms of hormones. So we're never looking at exactly apples to apples when we compare these tests. So that's important to remember, but serum, saliva, urine. When we're talking about sex hormones, they're in different forms, but the results should generally correlate, but it's never, it's never exactly the same measurement. And I think that's important to keep in mind as you're looking at different testing options. Now we said rule number one, stick with blood and unless you're compelled and until you're compelled to do otherwise. Rule number two is significant validation data really needs to be um, put forth before we abandon gold standard methods for an alternative, right? So when it comes to saliva and cortisol, not only has salivary cortisol shown itself to be equivalent to serum in terms of its utility, but it's actually better, right? It's free cortisol, and I don't have time to go into it, but it's pretty clear in the literature that if you want to measure cortisol and your options are serum or saliva, that saliva is really the gold standard for free cortisol uh, as it's measured, particularly if you want to measure it throughout the day. However, when you're talking about the sex hormones, saliva testing is not as powerful analytically for sex hormones. So I personally do not recommend it, and we have not developed testing for those hormones in saliva. The reason for that is the, the methods that are commercially available just aren't sensitive enough from what I've seen to give you good solid numbers 
that are improved over serum or urine values. In fact, I think they're, they're of less utility in terms of differentiating between the lows, the normals, and the highs. Now, you will find a couple publications, particularly this Wong study from 1990 is often cited to say, look, when we look in serum and when we look in saliva, we get correlating values. But the method that they're using here is probably 10 to 20 times more sensitive than what we're using in commercially available methods. And it's just looking at premenopausal women. So your postmenopausal women are gonna be down in this range here, and that hasn't been shown to correlate. Uh, the one on the right is a different study, much more recent, it's a completely different type of method, but they're looking at fertility cases. So these are very high levels of estrogen and were shown to correlate saliva as compared to serum. But again, not a commercially available method. There's only one, one paper that I could find that, uh, that I found to date that shows correlation uh, with a commercially available method. But before I show you that data, let me just show you this because this is really relevant when you're doing serum testing. This is serum testing of estradiol. And we're looking at LCMS, which uh, is the gold standard here. And then we're looking at these standard assays that are amino assays. Right? So what you find is when you're looking at the general concentration range in premenopausal women, hey, that's pretty nice correlation. But when you, when you zoom in on, so the postmenopausal range is maybe here-ish, you can see at those low levels, the analytical quality of the amino assay kind of starts to fail a little bit. And that goes down to close to 10. When we're looking at saliva, we're using similar technology, but the levels are much lower. So lesson number one to learn from that is, before I move on to this, is if you're using serum and you're looking at estradiol or testosterone, when you get down to low levels, so men for estrogen, kids for estrogen, postmenopausal for estrogen, or women or kids for testosterone, use the LCMS assay. It'll cost you a few dollars more. It'll probably be a little slower in terms of turnaround, much better data. Okay? Otherwise, those uh, standard assays that are generally amino assays work just fine. But when we try to apply immunoassay technology to salivary estradiol, this is the only published data from a commercially available assay that shows, in this case, plasma versus saliva. And it's just not a strong correlation. That does not mean that what's in saliva is not a true representation. What it means, it's very difficult to test well enough that that value should be trusted to ascertain whether the patient is indeed deficient or sufficient or in a state of excess. So that's why we don't support the idea of using saliva testing for monitoring reproductive hormones. We stick to cortisol. Okay, so significant validation data is needed. We wanna see commercially available assays showing serum correlation with what we're looking at. And then with our assay, the same burden of proof was on us. And so we've published data that shows statistical equivalence when looking at serum and our urine assay for both estradiol and progesterone, we also showed correlation between our four spot method and the 24 hour collection, which is the urine gold standard historically, and then also showing that dried urine results and liquid urine results return the same value. So the serum data was very nice from this. So you can see serum progesterone, serum estradiol as it compares to the urine um, we did that in, in a handful of women and then also included postmenopausal and different um, phases of the cycle and got really nice equivalent data. Now, why would we want to use a urine test? I mean, if serum works fine, why would we want to? Well, one advantage is that I think this woman whose data is published maybe is a little bit more exaggerated than the average woman, but in serum, you can see for her, she bounced between what, around six, and around 36 throughout one day, right? So if you draw her serum here, you get an eight. If you do it up here, uh, you're gonna get somewhere around 30. That's a pretty different number, right? All these values are high enough that you can tell that she did ovulate, but when you're looking for adequate progesterone production, it really depends when you test her, right? So urine testing, for us, we use four samples throughout the day. One represents the entirety of the overnight period, and then we have an early morning sample, uh, an afternoon evening sample, and then a bedtime sample, right? So you add those up, you get the majority of the day. So we're averaging out the highs and the lows, and that is really nice. Now, 
why else would you want to jump to urine? And that's something we'll talk about a little bit later, but comprehensiveness, right? I can look at not just estradiol, which correlates to serum, but I can also look at estrone and estriol and 2-hydroxyestrogens and 4-hydroxyestrogens and 16-hydroxyestrogens and methylated estrogens, 10 estrogen metabolites to tell the entire story of production, phase one and phase two metabolism. That's a, that's a nice set of data to evaluate someone's estrogen if given the chance that comprehensiveness is nice and that's what pushes people to urine testing. As I mentioned before, what pushes people to salivary testing is primarily cortisol. So when you look in the literature for cortisol, you're gonna find a lot of saliva because why? Serum testing is really inadequate. And as I said before, this is well established in the literature, so I'm not gonna go through why, but the free cortisol is superior. Where can we find free? It's not usually available in serum, but you can look at it in either urine or saliva. And the diurnal pattern is helpful in urine or saliva. What's the diurnal pattern? Well, you can see here on the left from the Dutch complete, on the right from the Dutch plus, um, so for our testing, we're looking at this really comprehensive spread of, of hormones, but the diurnal pattern of cortisol you can get either out of urine, as we can see on the left, or the same patient in this case did both tests, and we can see the saliva-free cortisol on the right. In this case, this person's really on fire early in the day, lots of cortisol. That up and down pattern is relevant, and we can see it in either urine or saliva. So the Dutch Complete and the Dutch Plus give us an opportunity to look at the cortisol pattern either way. Now, why would we want to create our test not just in urine, but also in saliva? Because in saliva, that's the only place you get an accurate representation, not just of the diurnal pattern, but of the cortisol awakening response. So why measure the cortisol awakening response? So that's the CAR, right? And this is getting to be much, uh, much better known in the community that this is, this is a really valuable measurement. So the diurnal pattern is up and down, right? We can see that throughout the day from the test. The CAR is just the difference between a waking sample and the plus 30 sample, right? So when you wake up, your body goes through the biochemistry that it goes through when you're stressed, right? So if we measure a sample in the first five minutes, which we use cotton swabs for that, which is really important because if you're trying to spit enough in five minutes to get a sample, it's really tough. So we use the cotton swabs, Instantly upon waking, you're done in maybe two minutes. You've got a five minute window to get that done. That's your baseline. And then boom, you get this cortisol surge, or you should, in the early part of the day. And if we measure again at 30 minutes, you can see the calculation of the cortisol awakening response. That is independently correlated to HPA axis function, right? So people with exaggerated cars are more likely to get depression. People, that's the, the situation you see here, right? That's a lot of cortisol in the early morning. Uh, if it's flat, you're more likely to be fatigued, even if you're in the normal range, because you're it shows your stress response, right? So we can do it in urine, we can do it, as you see on the left here, or we can do it in saliva, the, the diurnal pattern. So in some cases, it doesn't really matter which test you do, right? In these two cases, they're the same. So in urine, the first sample represents the overnight period. That second sample is sort of the entirety of that cortisol awakening time. Right, so that the big morning surge of cortisol you're supposed to see, which this person does not have, is shown in that second sample in the urine, and then you can see the other samples throughout the day. Right, so in this case, the fact that the cortisol awakening response doesn't go up isn't really helpful because you're just flat either way. Right, so anyway, you cut it. This patient has a deficiency in cortisol in the early part of the day. Now here's that result we just looked at where they're really really high. Now, do I need to calculate a cortisol awakening response here to know that they're on fire in the early part of the day? No, either test is gonna show you that yes, there's an appropriate diurnal pattern. Yes, the cortisol returns to where it should at bedtime. Otherwise, we might be thinking you know, adrenal tumor or pituitary tumor, but either way, you know the story here, on fire in the morning and then coming down later in the day, right? Now, when does it matter? So here we're returning to this original uh, cortisol pattern, right? So let's add in a second one. Now, if we look in urine at these, excuse me, let me go back there. If we look at urine, we can see flat and flat, right? 
they're kind of twins. Like there's really nothing to see that's different. What we can see in the in the the saliva of these two patients is probably noteworthy, and that is that this person's stress response is just not responsive, right? In the second person, yes, they're low. Yes, they probably could benefit from having their HPA axis a little bit stronger, but the fact that this resiliency remains means the difference between these two patients is somewhat significant. And in some cases, that fact is noteworthy and it might impact how you go about treating them, how you go about prioritizing which dysfunction they might have that we're gonna target first, okay? So the cortisol awakening response in this situation, instead of just looking at the cortisol in these first two hours, but getting more nuanced and looking at those first 30 minutes gave us a window into, some, into something that I think is useful. Here's another situation where we've got urine on the left, saliva on the right. They look pretty much the same. When I look at the second patient, the urine says again, ah, they're twins, right? Good morning response, low normal in the afternoon, low normal at bedtime, and that's it. When we look at the right at saliva, what we can see is this is an appropriate car. That's gonna fall within the range. This sample is within range. This sample is within range. But the difference between the two, that cortisol awakening response is exaggerated, which means one of two things. Either their stress response is overactive or they are experiencing a lot of stress, right? So the, the nuance between those two patients is noteworthy. And in some cases, it's really important. And that's where for us doing the Dutch Plus and doing the cortisol awakening response along with the diurnal pattern is really helpful. Okay, let's move along. So Dutch Complete and Dutch Plus, we've talked about. So we, we can also just look at the saliva patterns. We just want the saliva. That's a good piece of information. If you're doing a serum test for all your sex hormones and you just want the cortisol, uh, this is a nice thing to, uh, to have available. However, the reason that we do urine as well when we're looking at adrenals is we like to see the cortisol metabolites. I think those are really helpful and they're only available in urine. So why should we measure cortisol metabolites? Let's look at these two cases. They look really similar, right? This is urine-free cortisol, it's pretty low in both cases. And the, the total of those four is here, right? So add those four up, you're low either way. But look at the metabolites. So this is the best test of your stress response, of your free cortisol. This is the best test, the metabolites, of total glandular output, total production. In the top case, the person's on prednisone. Doesn't that make sense? Their cortisol production is getting shut down. In the second case, very, very different. Metabolites are super high. What does that mean? Increased cortisol clearance. Why is that? In this case, they were being overdosed on thyroid, which increases cortisol clearance, right? So there is a very strong relationship between thyroid status and the excretion of cortisol metabolites. Right, that's a pretty strong relationship. So when we took this patient and the, the physician normalized the thyroid dose, they were taking about twice as much as they really needed. Then we can see with the proper dose of thyroid, their, the cortisol stress response is returned. And now we can more properly evaluate what's going on here because there isn't a hyper excretion of that cortisol due to uh, the improper dosing of the thyroid. So there's a really complex relationship between thyroid and cortisol. And that's one of the reasons why we developed this test to include the metabolites is it gives you a window into the clearance of cortisol, which is helpful. The other situation other than thyroid cases where the metabolites are helpful is with obesity because obesity directly impacts clearance. If you look at the skinniest of the patients we've tested and the, the largest, there's a, in the cortisol metabolites, there's a huge relationship there. And this is consistent with the, the scientific literature that there's not a relationship between BMI and free cortisol, whether it's urine or saliva. So if you look at these two patients, they look again like twins, right? Urine free cortisol, pretty much the same pattern. Metabolites in the top confirm low production. Why? This patient actually has congenital adrenal hyperplasia. They actually have a genetic problem making cortisol and it shows in the result. The second patient is obese. Look at their cortisol production. Literally, this woman is making more cortisol than 99% of women. But you can't see it in the free cortisol because the fat traps the cortisol. 
it gets metabolized and excreted, right? This is happening continuously. The adrenal gland keeps up with it. So the amount of cortisol getting into the brain and from the stress response is not high, but the amount that the gland is actually producing is huge in this case. Differentiating between these two, and I don't have a lot of time to go into, uh, you know, how would we treat them differently? But we would want to treat them differently because their stories are incredibly different and having the metabolites helps us to see the distinction between those two cases. So this that's what really drove the development of the Dutch model is we want the cortisol pattern, we want the sex hormones, but we also want the metabolites of all these hormones, okay? And we're using dried urine samples collected on filter paper throughout the day to accomplish that, right? So that's the Dutch complete, that's the Dutch plus, right? With the cycle mapping, that's another testing option we have in case you wanna see estrogen, so in the red here, you can see estradiol going, the reference range is between the black lines. That's their estrogen pattern, right? There's ovulation, and here comes the progesterone surge following ovulation. If you wanna map it out throughout the cycle, we also have the cycle mapping option. So once we establish this Dutch model of testing, we said, well, what else can we add that would bring value and would be related? So we added a B6 marker, two of them actually, we added a B12 marker, methylmalonic acid, which most people are familiar with, a glutathione deficiency marker, a couple neurotransmitter metabolites, which have some utility, but th those are limited in terms of their utility, uh, an oxidative stress marker, and a marker for melatonin production. Now, when you're testing in blood, you have good options for estradiol, testosterone, DHEA, um, and progesterone. Cortisol, not so much. So what do functional medicine providers do? Historically, they've gone to saliva. Now, when you get this combination of serum and saliva to get the cortisol along with the sex hormones, your pricing's starting to get up there a little bit, right? And you've got to collect multiple samples. If you want estrogen metabolism, that's another panel. And then if you want some organic acids to look at, at nutrient deficiency, now we're up there in terms of price and effort for the patient, right? Four different tests, that's pretty challenging, right? And that's where the Dutch test has been really helpful at bringing in something comprehensive uh, that's reasonably priced that gives us a broad window into these hormones. So hormone testing rule number three, and this is just a very general, um, I guess, encouragement, is to remember that all lab tests occasionally will mislead you, right? And I could give you a a bunch of different examples of any test that I've ever worked with. There are scenarios within which it can be, the number that you get can be misleading. And so we need to use one, quality testing. Two, be slow to treat when the labs and the clinical picture don't align. Talk to your lab, ask some additional questions, but there will be scenarios where that's the case. And in some cases, that's because you need to reconfigure what you think is true of this patient. And in some cases, there may be an issue with the lab, something that's cross-reacting, uh, an interference of some sort. And that's why you know you want to use labs. And we use the highest, most accurate, highest quality tests available, LCMS when it's appropriate, GCMS, MS when it's appropriate. Um, and you want to use labs that really care about the quality of the methods. Um, and then Three, understand the limitations of each test that you're using. So a good example of that is when you start considering HRT. Now this is my guide that I've put together over several years. Um, and it just helps people. If you want a copy of this, um, feel free to reach out and be happy to share it. Um, I don't have saliva tested listed on here anymore because of the accuracy issues with sex hormones. And I, I don't think there's a scenario in which it's the best case, the best option for monitoring therapy. Um, if you look at a situation like oral progesterone, right? This is where we're gonna help you by saying, look, serum works great for progesterone, but what's a limitation? When you're on oral, so here's a research study that showed, here's baseline, you go to bed, right before bed, you take your oral progesterone, right? The true value of progesterone goes up a little bit and back down. Now, because of some cross-reactivity, which I'm not going to get into, but uh, a standard lab test is going to artificially be inflated. And so this is a better value accurately. But my point is, here's where your patient woke up. After eight hours, they drive to the, the wherever, get their blood drawn, and you are chasing this when it's no longer available to even measure it, right? 
serum testing is not a good match when you take oral progesterone. Urine testing has some relevant feedback. I'm not going to get into what that is, but those are the types of limitations that you need to know. And when it comes to HRT, that's something that we're happy to help with in terms of the education. Okay, so this can be helpful. We have videos on our website also that kind of walk through each one of these, going through the literature and the data that helps. Now, when it comes to us and Dutch, I, Dutch works really well. The urine testing works really well to monitor injections, pellets, um, oral progesterone, as I mentioned, vaginal estrogen and testosterone. And that one, we have a special method that removes the contamination potential. So that, that works very well. Um, transdermal estrogen and testosterone, you will often hear people say you cannot use urine testing to monitor transdermal estrogen. And often that's coming from people who are promoting salivary testing. Um, I will tell you, um, although there are educators who promote that, I have not found a single literature reference, a single study that supports the idea of, of taking transdermal estrogen and testosterone and using salivary testing. The clinical picture, when you look at clinical endpoints, whether it's bone mineral density, um, hot flashes, muscle mass increase in men, LH suppression, um, hematocrit increasing, all of those seem to dance with the serum and with what's going on in urine. There are uh, the, the one exception to that, I would say, it, it, just in that there is no data, is for transdermal estrogen creams. For the gels, there's lots of there's good serum data. And for the creams and gels, there's good urine data that shows what's going on. There's not any good serum data for estrogen creams. But generally, uh, these modes of, of taking HRT work really well with Dutch. For testosterone, particularly in men, I recommend also doing a serum test. Um, but I won't go into that in any detail. Now, for us, things that don't work. Oral estrogen doesn't work for urine testing. Vaginal progesterone is not well monitored by a urine test. I would recommend serum in those situations, okay? Um, these are the no-gos. Sublingual hormones, I'm not saying don't take them. I'm saying no lab is going to give you meaningful feedback that will help you adjust your dose. If you want to know why, that's a longer story. Transdermal progesterone is another one. People have different opinions on this. Uh, I've been looking into this for over a decade. My opinion would be don't use it when you have estrogen on board. Um, use it for symptom relief in people um, in certain situations, but the lab testing is not helpful. You're going to get big highly variable numbers that have nothing to do with what's going on clinically in saliva, also in blood spot. Uh, you're going to get very low values in urine and serum, even as you escalate the dose. Uh, when you increase the dose of transdermal estrogen and testosterone, urine and serum go up linearly and in a dose-dependent manner. That is not true of transdermal progesterone because of how fat-soluble it is, and saliva is going in the other direction. It's going way, way high in those situations and I think with progesterone, none of them actually give you um, a lot of good data or any good data when it comes to transdermal progesterone. And again, we could discuss that at length, um, but that's not the central topic for today. So I wanted to just kind of walk you through a case study where comprehensive advanced testing, it can be really helpful. Okay, 30 year old, uh, this is a mother of two, premenopausal, really suffering with some mood issues. Um, you're gonna see this type of dial, which is from our, our new reports that aren't out yet, uh, but you're gonna see it smaller, so you may not be able to read it. But uh, what we're showing here is these are age-dependent ranges. So 18 to 40, 41 to 60, greater than 60. And then, and then this is the overall range. So this is a little bit high for total DHEA production. So as we look at these results, what you can see, here's our patient, high estradiol high normal progesterone. So good, strong progesterone, but too much estrogen. So if we're looking at estrogen dominance, you got it right there. More estrogen than is balanced by progesterone. Testosterone within normal, DHEA production a little high. This is that really hot cortisol in the morning, but it returns down. And then the total of that is high. The metabolites are pretty high. So what do we see here? Too much cortisol, overactive HPA axis, and too much estrogen relative to progesterone, okay? That's our summary. Then we dig in with greater detail. We can see testosterone metabolites here. There's not much to see here. Everything's within normal. I'm not gonna go into those. But why would we wanna measure the hormone metabolites? Let me show you that first with the androgens, okay? So total DHEA production is, let's add up all the metabolites um, that come from DHEA that are directly related, and those are the three below, okay? So the total is a little bit high, 
DHEAS, which is what we normally look at in blood or saliva, is for 18 to 40, that's where she is. She's low normal. Okay, but the other DHEA metabolites are pretty high. Now, one of the observations we'll make, and this is just one of many observations and patterns that we get into, is that this sulfation process going from DHEA to DHEA sulfate is inhibited by inflammation. So someone with high estrogens, which is promoted by inflammation, and a lower DHEAS compared to the downstream metabolites, I'm thinking about inflammation. Okay, the other thing I'm thinking about here is what about androgenic metabolism? Does she push, like say a PCOS woman would, down the 5-alpha pathway? So she doesn't. She's pretty well balanced there, right? So if the DHEA production was identical, this is identical, but she pushes it more down this 5-alpha direction, right? So if she's pushing down this direction less of the beta, which is not androgenic. Now we would, this, those are not her results, but if they were, now we'd be thinking about, okay, insulin, 5-alpha, that's gonna promote hair loss and high androgen symptoms because it means your testosterone is gonna make DHT from the 5-alpha pathway. So we can evaluate DHA production and testosterone production just like we can in serum, just like we can in saliva, but we can also look at androgenic metabolism and that's a nice thing to see. The other thing we can see is estrogen metabolism, right? So first we look at production. So mostly just looking at E1, E2, but we're also glancing down below and we can see high, right? Very high. Um, then we wanna look at the phase one metabolites. Okay, so 2-hydroxy, which we know is more cancer friendly, as in it's better for you than the 4-hydroxy estrogen, which is more carcinogenic. And then the 16-hydroxy E1, which is a very powerful estrogen. So it's more estrogenic than the rest, 4-hydroxy is carcinogenic, 2-hydroxy we think of as protective. So we want to look at these. They're pretty high. We got a lot of 4-hydroxy. We don't like that, right? Why don't we like that? Because we know that 4-hydroxy damages DNA, rips a piece of your DNA off, and that's why it has carcinogenic potential. So if we have too much of it, we might want to reduce that. What else might we want to think about? Well, how about methylation detox? If you methylate it, it doesn't hurt your DNA. So we look at methylation, right? Here's the 2-hydroxy again, and here's 2-methoxy. That shows methylation. So if the 2-methoxy is just barely elevated, I'm expecting that 2-methoxy would also be just barely elevated, but it's not, it's higher. So what does that mean? That shows me that she's a good methylator. So, and this is from our new uh, format that's not out yet, so this looks a little different than the current report, but either way, you're gonna see that that ratio is high. Right, she's a good methylator. Hey, I feel good about that, right? Lots of 4-hydroxyestrogen, but she methylates well. Okay, what else do I have to work on here? Glutathione detox. That's why we added the glutathione deficiency marker, and wouldn't you know it, it's high. Now, with the organic acids, like methylmalonic acids, anthurinate, pyroglutamate, when they're elevated, it's a problem, right? So you have a deficiency potentially in the, the relevant nutrient when the marker is high. In this case, pyroglutamate is very high, Right, so what's our treatment here? Well, we know we need HPA axis support, right? We wanna lower those estrogens, so what did we use? A, a, a combination product that has calcium deglucurate, which lowers our, our, it helps us get rid of estrogen, right? And diendylmethane, which helps us push down the 2-hydroxy pathway. We also gave her glutathione. Here's her follow-up test for the glutathione marker. It worked, right? So now we're getting better glutathione detox, okay? We also gave her estrogen lowering products and look at those estrogens move. Okay, so estrogen production much, much lower. But what else do we notice? Which estrogen metabolite is not significantly lower? 2-hydroxy, why? Because we opened up this drain, right? The DIM is pushing estrogen down that pathway and especially away from E1, E2, and it's inhibiting the estrogen from going down these more estrogenic, I mean, look at that change, right? 16 hydroxyestrogens went from almost high to in uh, the postmenopausal range. So for estriol, this is the postmenopausal range. And she's clear down in there, why? Because we lowered her overall estrogens, right? So those probably brought them down into the normal range. And then opening up the DIM provides us a way to modulate phase one metabolism. And the point is the urine test is a great way to get a window into what's going on here.
Okay, so before and after, what happened? Her estradiol was reduced dramatically. Her progesterone was not treated, and it's pretty much the same going from 16 to 15. So estrogen dominance, the concept of estrogen dominance looks much improved here, right? Because we drug that estradiol down. Okay, DHEA production is a little bit lower, so we'd expect testosterone to be a little bit lower, um, still within the normal range, uh, but we're gonna wanna keep an eye on that. And then the cortisol, the HPA axis, this is just two months, uh, we really didn't touch this, right? We've still got this on-fire cortisol situation. Okay, lots of free cortisol. The metabolites are a little bit lower, so when it looks like that, I, I wanna check in on the thyroid and say, hey, because she's not, um, doesn't have any other issue that would lead to that pattern. Um, so I might check in on the thyroid and make sure that there's not sluggish cortisol clearance, because if so, you might be able to pull this down potentially as you optimize the thyroid and the um, cortisol is more rapidly cleared. In a case like this, I would definitely recommend taking thyroid if you take it in the morning, because your thyroid and hormone level is gonna be the highest in the morning. And that's when you've got that high level of cortisol. Now, six months later, we tested her cortisol again, and it was much, much more normal. Now, it was a longer gap than I was hoping for in this situation, so you know, I, I'm not sure what did it. We did adrenal support. The other thing I had her do is eat some foods that are going to keep her blood sugar a little bit higher when she went to bed, which could mean, because cortisol is a glucocorticoid, if you wake up fasting, your cortisol may be more bouncy, if you will, to try to raise your blood sugar. So if you wake up and your blood sugar is already doing okay, maybe it pulls this cortisol down. Maybe it was the adrenal support. I don't know. Uh, the other thing we added to the test in the meanwhile is we've got this insomnia sample. She doesn't sleep very well in the middle of the night, right? So what she did then is when she woke up at, say, 2.30, she popped one of these uh, salivettes in her mouth to collect saliva takes a minute, put it back in there and try to go back to sleep. We measure that to basically ask the question, is cortisol driving the insomnia? In this case, if she's not sleeping, we wanna look at other things, right? Maybe her melatonin's not okay. Maybe there are some other reasons why um, she's not sleeping, but doesn't seem to be driven by the cortisol. So that's a nice option for our Dutch Plus. Uh, that's an extra sample uh, that you can use, uh, which is a, is a recent addition for us. So all of these, um, markers we're able to look at in one test uh, and it really just gives you a nice uh, broad look at what's going on with reproductive and adrenal hormones and the things that are related so i hope that's been helpful uh, not just in you know the idea of what a, a nice option the dutch test is but also giving you uh, some information on when to maybe grab for each tool right you're going to need to have um, serum testing is forever going to be in your toolbox. Saliva testing for sure with cortisol. Uh, and then the urine testing for this comprehensive look at your hormones. Um, so if you have some questions, we do have, um, hey, I'm right on time. Uh, gold star for me. So it is 45 minutes in and we've got an hour. If we um, run a little bit long, we've got a little bit of a uh, of time that we can we can take questions. So I think they're uh, running through the questions now and we'll bring those to me. Um, first question is when looking at HRT, can you repeat what you said about transdermal estrogen? So that's that's a like a half an hour conversation, and I uh, apologize for kind of jamming it in there, but it's it's a common misconception that um, that people have. You know, the biggest problem we've had, I think, in this industry with trying to unpack that is this: is that one, what we've learned about progesterone, we have applied to estrogen and testosterone, and that has not helped because those hormones behave very differently. Right, progesterone is very lipophilic; it behaves very differently then do uh, estrogen and testosterone. And so when you increase the dose of estrogen and testosterone, up, up, up goes the urine and the serum result, whereas that's not true of progesterone. So we've gotten off base there. The other place that we've gotten off base is by making this assumption. Look, a premenopausal woman was at a certain level, then she hit menopause and I wanna give her estrogen. So what do I do? Well, I better get her back to that place where she once 
was, right? That is not true. You do not need necessarily to push a woman's estrogen clear back to luteal levels that she had when she was 30 in order to see clinical impact. You can use a patch dose, for example, of 0.014, uh, certainly 0.025, those are lower doses. And you're going. the data shows that you get bone mineral density increasing. The data shows that the um, hot flashes are um, suppressed better than the placebo group. And you haven't gotten really that close to the premenopausal norm, right? So that's, that's a good thing to know. Now, when we move from a patch to a gel or a cream, we can push a urine value to those same levels by using doses of 0.025. And that's that actually makes a lot of sense using those moderate doses of 0 0.025, 0 0.5, and we get an increase in the levels, um, and we're seeing the clinical picture move, right? You're seeing bone mineral density increase in women. You're seeing hot flashes get better relative to placebo. And what we find is as you go below about 0 0.25, um, you see those clinical improvements disappearing. Right, but at that dose where it's just starting to work, the urine and the serum are creeping closer to the premenopausal range, but they're not quite there. But what we also find at those doses is that salivary values are well above the luteal range, meaning the salivary message is, wow, we've got a huge excess of uh, of hormone here, and that's not that's that's not the reality that we find when we look at the clinical picture. That's not the reality that we find in serum or in urine. Um, and again, that's a pretty complicated topic. But so my advice for people with estrogen is is you know start low and go slow. Um, you know starting at doses of you know around 0 0.25 or patches of 0 0.025 uh, are going to work pretty well. You know keep monitoring those symptoms uh, and push those levels. You know, generally just out of the postmenopausal range and into the early part of the premenopausal range, and that's generally where you're going to find some success. Okay, second question: Could you repeat why we need to measure the metabolites of cortisol if we're already measuring free cortisol? So there again is where you stumble upon, you know, a bit of a complex topic, right? So you've got multiple, you know, windows to look in to see what's going on with the HPA axis and that function. The free pattern throughout the day is the most important thing we can have, right? And it's a good way to look at our stress response, but particularly when we look at the cortisol awakening response, right? But the free hormone is only about 1% of the total, 2% at the most, right? So it's a great picture of available, bioavailable hormone, but it is not a great picture of total glandular output. So when the total of the metabolites tells the same story as the free cortisol, that is very confirming of what you think you know when you look at free cortisol. It's the times, and I, you know, I'd say 25 maybe 35% of the time, you get a little bit of a different picture. And in some cases, it's quite profound where we learn from the metabolites that the patient is actually putting out a lot more cortisol than you think or a lot less cortisol than you think. So now I'm thinking, okay, I may have not abnormal production necessarily, but I may have abnormal cortisol clearance. So that's when I start to think about things like thyroid, checking in on the thyroid. If they're obese, what am I going to find? I'm going to find lots of metabolites. Right now, the free cortisol might be high, it might be low. We don't know until we look at that, right? But if it's low and the metabolites are very high, then you have this kind of complex situation. When you take patients like that and you aggressively ramp up their cortisol production, what you often find is you you don't have the clinical success that you think you're going to find. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because cortisol's first home, the first place it goes, is within the adrenal medulla. So it's made in the outside part of the adrenal gland, pushed through the adrenal uh, medulla at very high concentrations. So concentrations that are 100 times what circulates in your serum, right? So there's this place in the middle of your adrenal gland where you get huge uh, cortisol concentrations. And if the metabolites are high, you can pretty well assume that that adrenal medulla is flooded with cortisol, 
right? So now if I increase cortisol production even more so, well, what goes on in the adrenal medulla? Epinephrine is made from norepinephrine, right? Epinephrine is made from norepinephrine. That conversion is cortisol dependent. Cortisol drives the conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine. So if you take that situation that's already flooded with cortisol and you ramp it up even more in response to the low free cortisol, you can get negative outcomes in your patients. So what I tell people in that situation is one, you're gonna wanna work obviously uh, on the obesity, on the insulin issues, right? Um, but you're gonna wanna support the HPA axis probably in a way that doesn't ramp up cortisol production uh, because of this situation, right? Whereas if their cortisol metabolites were low and their free cortisol is low, then you're probably in a situation where you would more aggressively consider uh, promoting cortisol production to try to deal with issues like fatigue. So free cortisol, is your best window into the stress response, the best window into what's bioavailable and active and in the periphery. And the metabolites represent overall production. And so we like to look at both. Um, and we found that that really helps you to run in the wrong direction less, if that makes sense, right? When you only have half the picture and sometimes it's very misleading, you can aggressively treat a patient in a way that's counterproductive. And we want to avoid doing that. What treatment regimen, another question, did you use on this patient that we had the case study? So remember we had high estrogen, right? So on that we used calcium decalucurate and DIM. Um, we had no real issue with the androgens. Those looked fine, although the DHA was a little bit high. Um, and then we had we just gave them some some glutathione to try to deal with that glutathione deficiency or apparent glutathione deficiency due to that marker uh, being elevated. And then we used um, somebody's product that is generally used when cortisol is high, right? So it's going to have phosphatidylserine and adaptogens um, in it, and, uh, along with other things. And we used those for a couple months without success. Um, and then again, we seem to have some major success over more time. Uh, and then obviously there's some lifestyle things that we were doing, which I'm not sure we got super good compliance on that, um, but we were able to affect the estrogen dominance and the glutathione deficiency. And then over time, and, and this is what you likely find in your practice is that some of those issues that are uh, have been going on for a long time, like the HPA axis, um, which can be impacted from you know before birth, uh, that sometimes that takes some time to really make some headway on. So that was the treatment regimen for the 30-year-old patient. Uh, let me just look through our questions here. I think we've got a couple more. All right, so next question. What's the best way to test for melatonin? So we have a melatonin measurement on the Dutch test. So when you measure melatonin in serum while you sleep over and over and over again while you sleep, that's obviously not possible, right? We're not doing that. But when they do that in research and then they compare that to wake up in the morning and empty your bladder, take some of that urine and measure it for the melatonin metabolite, that metabolite from that sample correlates really well to adding up the melatonin that you've made at night from looking at the serum, right? So that's what we're doing. The waking sample, we're testing for 6-hydroxymelatonin sulfate. Is it a good test? Yes. Does it have limitations? Yes. It is completely and utterly worthless if you're on melatonin therapy. So take a low dose, take a high dose, it doesn't matter. A urine test does not work for monitoring therapy, but it's a nice baseline test to look at melatonin. How else can you do it? Saliva works well. Um, so the saliva test is going to have you wake up in the middle of the night, let's say 2 a.m. or whatever, and look at your melatonin. Excuse me, your melatonin. Um, that's an option. Um, the advantage um, is it's relatively easy to do. You're only it's only one moment in time. Some people peak at you know 1 a.m. Some people peak at 3 a.m. So you've got to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, but that is a possibility. The other thing you have to be careful of is if you go into the bathroom, turn the lights on, and you know get your stuff together, and then finally do your test. Your levels are going to start plummeting as soon as you turn the light on. So you just need to be careful with how that's done. Excuse me, grabbing a drink. All right, uh, my last question I have here, 
is, is it possible to do a phone consult for interpretation for DIM and which supplements to use for methylation to increase estrogen clearance? So if you want to work on uh, phase one and phase two, you know, certainly we have seven doctors that are on staff here. They work uh, all day on the phone, just explaining results to people, helping people with treatment. Um, that's one of the advantages to working with us is this thing, the Dutch test, is all we do. So all day, every day, we're knee deep in hormones and metabolites and, you know, the studies that are related to that. And the, the doctors that we have on staff here use the test in their practice. They have years of experience. And so they're able to really help people wrap their mind around uh, what's going on uh, with a particular result. And then to start, you know, exploring like what sort of options people might might entertain um, as we start to to get into treatment. Obviously, we have some limitations in how much treatment um, advice we can give people, but they're really experienced doctors that can help with that. So for things like DIM, like it's a complicated topic, right? Because DIM pushes estrogen down the 2-hydroxy pathway. Um, you know, yay, that's good. Except if you don't need it, you don't want to use it because, or this is sort of my opinion, because 2-hydroxylation of estrogens results in something good. But 2-hydroxylations of things like polyaromatic hydrocarbons and other toxins actually make them more toxic. So you don't want to use it indiscriminately. And that's where, you know, learning and thinking through these things and using the testing to ask the question, which patient actually could benefit from that um, would be helpful. Um, Kate wants to correct me. I have no problem with that. Did I say epinephrine is made in the cortex? Um, that is not correct, if that's what I said. Uh, so the cortisol is made in the, in the cortex, gets funneled into the medulla at really high concentrations, and in the medulla, epinephrine is made from norepinephrine with the assistance of cortisol. So if I said cortex, um, you're absolutely right. That is not correct, so thanks for, for correcting that. And it's an, an interesting and important distinction when you start, uh, we start looking at that and looking at cortisol metabolites and, and what's um, going on there. And also, you know, interesting when you start talking about cortisol supplementation, because what's going on in the cortex is important, right? It's a hundred times circulating levels. So you can never touch that with Cortef or something that's hydrocortisone supplementation, right? If I take cortisol and my serum levels return to normal, that's maybe that's good for my brain. But the levels that are in the adrenal medulla are not going to touch the levels that they generally are at physiologically because it comes from the adrenal cortex and goes right in there at high concentrations. If it's coming from a pill, it can't do that. Um, so we always want to return normal function of the HPA axis if we can, right? So supplementation there can be used. I'm certainly not an expert in that, but that is an, an an element of that that you'll want to consider when you're giving um, hydrocortisone. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out at info at dutchtest.com. I can also be reached at M Newman, M N E W M A N, at dutchtest.com. Um, we love talking hormones, so if you have some questions, it doesn't have to relate to our test. You know, we really like unpacking this whole issue of when to use which test, which can be kind of complicated. Um, and uh, we're happy to be a resource for you on that. And we thank you very much for joining us today.